Hello, everyone. Dr. Robert Stanley with the Stanley Institute. Today, we're going to do something a little different. Today, we're going to talk about why implants fail. The way we're going to do that is we're going to actually step through a series of failures that have happened in my office, and I will show you the reasons why these implants failed. So if you've been watching the channel for any time, you know we have the shapes of dentistry, the shapes of implants, and we have the Snoopy, we have the heart, and we have the ET. Those are our three main shapes. Today, what I wanna do is start with the Snoopy, of course. So let's go to the overhead camera and zoom in close on, a, on an implant case that failed and talk about reasons why it failed. So here's a very interesting case. In this particular case, we have a restoration that was made out of zirconia, monolithic, monolithic zirconia. It was cemented down onto a hybrid tie base, and it wasn't in the mouth very long. It was only in the mouth, it was under a year, when the patient reported back and said that the tooth was loose. Once we took the tooth out of the, out of the mouth, you can see that the, the neck of the tooth here was broken, so we're missing all of the, of the zirconia in that region. But notice that the overall projection of this tooth, to me, looks like a Snoopy. So this is the snout over here, the nose would be there, the eyes are here, and the ears are back here, right? So here's his little grin right through there, okay? So when you see a Snoopy, what you're really looking at is you're looking at an opportunity for uh, forces to come down on the mesial aspect of this crown right here. As they come down on this, it puts this into a bending moment a bending moment. It wants to bend this down. So imagine if this was like a diving board and you were standing out here jumping up and down on this tip, this board would want to bend. So as it bends, it puts a lot of stress here at the interface between the prosthesis and the stock abutment. And what happened here is it broke. Now, when we say Snoopy, we have this cantilever, which is one problem, but the second problem we have here is lab fabrication. So I'm going to turn this over. So as I turn this over, I want you to look at it from this side here. From this side here, notice that the emergence profile, so from the, the neck here down, is the same profile as a stock healing abutment, all right? Now this happens a lot and it's our responsibility as dentists to give the lab instructions on how to manage soft tissue. They are so used to working with stone models that the concept of moving soft tissue is foreign to them. I like to say that the dental labs are working in the stone ages. That's my little uh, colloquialism for them, okay? So this is the profile that they saw on the stone model. So obviously they can't adjust that, so they came straight up and then out. And so this starts to look, if you have this on both sides, it starts to look like what we call the ET in that it has a very straight emergence and then like a 90 degree angle here, straight out the side. And when that happens, you get extremely high stresses, whoops, right in this region right here. And those stresses combined with bending forces on the marginal ridge out here can create an opportunity for failure. Now, the interesting thing about this particular case is that we actually restored this case without doing anything different, but just giving the lab direction on how to fill this in. So instead of having this big Snoopy here, what we said was right in this region right here, I want you to fill it, that in with zirconia. And they filleted that in with zirconia and they, uh, they filleted this distal side in right here with zirconia. And when they did, what we ended up getting is a heart shape. And once we got the heart shape, it went back in the mouth and we haven't seen the patient since. And that's been a number of years now. Why is that? Because if you get the heart shape, you've got an idealized solution. We love to see the heart. And then when we're talking about the heart, it can be clinically like this, or it can be on a two-dimensional radiograph. So if you look at a, a PA of the tooth, of the implant, and it looks like a heart, it has a nice emergence profile, and it has the implants in the center of the, of the prosthesis, you would probably have that solution for forever. It, it's quite possible that it could run forever. But to think that this being a very, very strong material made out of zirconia could break like this, you have to understand the power. When you see a Snoopy, you have immense power in terms of knowing how this case might play out and what potential problems the patient might face going forward. And you can start to mitigate those problems 
and work with the patient long before this actually fails. You know, you can talk to them about, Mrs. Smith, this screw might loosen over time. And if it does, don't worry about it. Come in and we'll tighten it for you. Because with these, can with these cantilevers, these Snoopies, you can have screw loosening, you can have prosthetic breakage, you can have prosthetic screw breakage, you could have a button breakage, you could have implant breakage, you could have a lot of problems. Why? Because our products are made for axial loaded. They're designed for the forces to come down this way, down through the implant. And when we have a solution where the, implant, where the load is coming out here and creating a bending moment, all of these things start to potentially fail. Now what I wanna do is go to yet another case to illustrate this point even more. What I have here is a failed implant and a custom abutment. And as I rotate it to the side, you might immediately say, okay, what is going on here? And yeah, that's exactly what I'm thinking, but it's a Snoopy. It doesn't have a crown on it anymore, but anytime you have a cantilever like this, where it shoots out like that, and then the crown would be up here, that's a Snoopy, okay? So this is a cantilever way out to the, so this implant was placed too far this way. And so it's not in the right spot. Now, it may have been placed anatomically. Anatomical placed implants are implants that are placed where the bone is. This is how we used to do it. We would look in the mouth, wherever the bone was, that's where the implant went. And after the implant integrated, then the prosthodontist or the restoring dentist would have to restore it. And so the restorative solution might be something like this, a very lovely created custom abutment and then a prosthesis that sticks out. Now. Just like before, when the forces on this are coming down like this, on, the, on this margin of the, of the restoration, it wants to bend this. It wants to bend this. Every time that force comes down here and hits out here, it wants to bend it that way. And what happens is, is that the implant failed. So this whole implant came out, the prosthesis came off first, and then the implant was loose and the whole apparatus came off. And, it makes for a great little demonstration of how Snoopy's are a dental implantologist nightmare. You just don't want to see them. If this solution had a crown that had a heart-shaped crown that was right over the top of this implant, right over the center of it, then the likelihood of failure would have been much, much lower. Let me show you yet another Snoopy. As I rotate this around and get it in focus for you, let's get this in focus right there. You can see we have a relatively short implant compared to the crown, but we also have an implant that's placed too far to the distal. Now, how far, how do we know it's too far to the distal? Well, if we rotate here, here's how you know, okay? So the hole between the buccal and the lingual looks good, right? The buccal lingual the dimension looks good. It's halfway between the two. That looks really good. But the access hole for the screw channel should be more here in the center from the mesial to the distal. So when it's back distal like this, then immediately, even without seeing or even without seeing a radiograph, if I see an access hole like this in the mouth, I'm immediately concerned about loads, mechanical loads that could cause complications for my patient. So when you turn it to the side here, you can see, yep, you're right, doc. If I get this in focus for you, there's quite, from the center line of the implant to way out here, that's quite a Snoopy, you know, but there's your snout, there's your eye, here's your smile over here, right? Snoopy. Now. When I see a solution like this, I don't want to condemn the doctor for placing a small implant like this because it's quite possible with these new short implants to place a short implant under the antrum and, and have it work. So with these seven threads engaged in bone in maybe seven millimeters of bone subantral, we can get an implant to work. But there's a caveat, and this is the one that a lot of doctors fail to listen to and or hear at trade shows and podiums. And that is, is that these implants carry the load in the first five threads, as I've talked about in my five thread video. The problem is those are axial loads. Well, what is an axial load, doc? Well, an axial load is when a load comes this way, it comes straight from the top and it comes down on the implant like this. So if you load your implant directly on the axial direction like this, with a short implant like this, it should last a very long time. The problem is, is when you have a Snoopy and the load comes out here, it hits that marginal ridge there, it wants to bend the implant like that. And when you want to bend an implant, then, then having short implants is not recommended. It's not recommended, not from biology, from mechanics, okay? Think about this. If this implant was a lever, 
okay? Uh, if you have a short lever or I had, let's say, a uh, 15 millimeter lever. So let's say the implant was this long from here to here. Which implant can resist the bending more? The longer one. If you had a telephone pole and you had a telephone pole in the ground and it was only a few feet in the ground right here, it's just a few feet in the ground, and you had another telephone pole that went way down to the ground, like this far in the ground, which telephone pole would be harder to pull out of the ground or, how, or blow over in a windstorm? The one that's got more roots, more to pull in the ground. So remember this. This is the part that gets left out when we talk about short implants work when they're loaded axially. So this is a doctor failure point. If you don't load this axially, you can have a short implant fail quite readily. So what would we do if this presented in our office, it wasn't ours, or, or it was ours, we placed it and we didn't get it right, and, we, and we, we wanted to give them a solution without retrieving the implant and starting over, how could we manage this? Well, here's what you can do. You come here and you do an occlusal equilibration where you make certain that there's only centric stop right there. No excursions and definitely no contact on the mesomarge ridge here. If you eliminate this from a tooth to tooth contact, okay, you still can't el eliminate food, a bolus of food going between here, but, but tooth to tooth contact is very important. If we can eliminate that force on this mesomarginal ridge, then we can really reduce the possibility of there being uh, loads that want to bend this uh, in so any corner of parafunction or even in normal function, okay? So no, no contact here at all. We want to make sure that contact's directly over the implant. So we have a, a centric load with no excursive slides at all. No, no blue skids on these, uh, on these inclines whatsoever. And if you do that, you can really potentially extend the life of, of a solution that is otherwise a Snoopy, which is otherwise a real big potential complication. Today, I've shown you a few cases where we have Snoopies that resulted in bad outcomes. And I've mentioned hearts, but I have not shown you any failures on the table here that look like hearts. Isn't that interesting? Remember, if you have a heart-shaped solution, you likely have a solution that should last a very, very long time, if not forever. So I don't have any heart-shaped solutions that have failed to show you. And that's supporting the concept that if you balance the forces directly over the top of the implant and you put in a reputable implant, the likelihood of failure is very, really, really is really, really low. If you wanna learn more about the science behind how these Snoopies create problems, then check out our video on the shapes of implants, and that should help a whole lot. Smile Engineer, out.